So, someone asked me recently, um, how do you do row reduction? And, uh, you know, that's an interesting question. Uh, I immediately thought like, oh, you know what? I'm going to make a video on this because, um, because otherwise I would have to explain it over text. And, and that's a mess. Like I could write a latex PDF, whatever. Um, but I could also just make a video because, uh, it's more fun, I think, than, than writing LaTeX, right? Um, and I thought like, oh, 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 you know what? Uh, why don't I just put it on YouTube? Because mm, then uh, it could be shared and, and it might be useful. Uh, but when you put things on YouTube, you immediately think like, yeah, yeah, but I want to make it appealing or, or whatever. Um, short form, 10 minutes is uh, the hotspot for the algorithm, whatever. And I, I tried recording a video earlier um, about this. And I realized that ah, it, it really is uh, just a bother to, to make it appealing to YouTube audiences. So, I mean, I'm, I'm still going to upload this on YouTube, but I'm just going to, I'm going to take my time be myself, maybe say uh too often, and uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, um, have some uh, radio silence every now and then, even though, like, uh, what we know from, from streaming and YouTube is that there should never be a gap in, in impulses, but you know, I'm, I'm just going to make this a long-form content, and you can sit back and enjoy this, you can skip, you can also not watch it, I really don't care, but I just want you to, if you want to learn row reduction and know how and why to use it and maybe you can even use it to analyze um you know uh, state space systems or whatever systems of e linear equations um you know if you want to if you want to learn a little bit about that you can just watch this video and uh, it's fine just enjoy it so uh let's get started So first of all, um, we need a uh, linear system. I'm just, it's a system of linear equations. I'm just going to refer to it as a system or a linear system because I'm lazy and there is really nothing else that I sh sh could mean with it. So uh, yeah, it's up to you to figure it out. Um, this is a little bit thick. Yeah, that's better. All right. So first of all, let's let's define some system, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna use this system. X one, x two equals two and three. Now you don't need row reduction to solve a linear system, right? Because first of all, that's why we use uh, row reduction is because from looking at this system, it is not trivial to me what the solution is. So we could write this down as the uh, individual linear equations that are, um, that make up the system, right? So for example, I can one plus two equals two. That is the first row multiplied by x and the second row multiplied by x gives us x1 minus x2 equals 3. So uh, it's, I mean, it's easy to solve these equations. Uh, 1 plus 1 is 2, 4 minus 1 is 3. Um, but there are infinite amount of uh, solutions because... Uh, Minus 1 plus 3 is also 2, etc., etc. 0 plus 2 is also 2. And the same with the second equation. As long as the difference between x1 and x2 is 3. So it could be 53 and 3 for all I care. The solution will still be 3. So there is no single solution uh, for both of these equations. When it gets interesting is when we say, yeah, yeah, wait, wait. This is a 
system of linear equations, which means they are related. In other words, this x1 and this x2, they are two variables, not four. So if this x1 is one, then this x1 needs to be one. And the same with x2 is that there's only one x2, there's only one x1, but we want both equations to be true at the same time. So if we take one plus one is two, and we take one minus one is zero, that's not three. So one and one, or x1 and x2, is actually not a solution to the system. So how do we find solutions to this system? Well, first of all, you don't need row reduction for this. It's actually easier to not use row reduction for this. What you could just do is you could say x1 equals two minus x2. That's just rewriting this first equation. Then this expression we found for x1, we could just substitute in the second equation. So we get two minus x2 minus x2 equals three. Solve this for x2 and you will get x2 equals minus one over two. Now we found a numerical value for x2 and we can substitute that back into the first equation. So what you would get is um, x1 plus minus 1 over 2 is 2. So that gives us x1 is 5 over 2. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So we found the solution x is 5 over 2 minus 1 over 2. You can pause the video and you can plug these two values into both of these two equations and you will see that they are true at the same time but um, this becomes a little bit more difficult if we have let's name this matrices a x and b suppose we have a really large a so it's 10 by 10 and we also need 10 x variables and we will get 10 outputs um, I'm not going to bother write it down for you. Um, you should just believe me that if you want to write it down, it's already a little bit cumbersome. But if you want to solve this through substitution, I wish you a lot of luck. And uh, I hope you have fun doing it because you will spend a lot of time <laughs> trying to solve that. So there's really no point in doing that. When systems become larger, as we say, um, it becomes much, much harder to solve them in these scalar ways. And scalars are just numbers, just two is a scalar, right? So we didn't look at this as vectors or matrices. We looked at it as just singular equations and, uh, and numbers and single variables. So that's why we call it scalar. And um, so these, these scalar methods of solving this yeah, I mean, if you would give me this system, uh, if you're really used to row reduction, it is as fast as doing the scalar method because you can immediately see if you have some experience with this, what the row reduced system will look like. Because what is row reduction? Well, yeah, that's a good question. We know why we do it. I just said it, if our system becomes too large, it becomes cumbersome to do it in a scalar method. So we need a standardized vector method or matrix method to solve it, right? That's why. Now, uh, how? Okay. What I want you to see first is that if we have a different, um, if we have a different linear system, I'm just gonna call it, um, you know what, I'm just going to do this with y1 and y2, so it's absolutely clear that it's a different system. And for five even different numbers here. Now, if we want to solve this equation, this system, that is, matrix equation, it's very easy. 
because by solving this matrix multiplication, we see y1 equals 4, y2 equals 5, and that kind of already is the solution, right? So suppose our A matrix is diagonal, or even better, identity, then suddenly it becomes super easy to just see from the matrix what our solution will be to the system. And that is what we're trying to achieve with row reduction, is to, if we cannot diagonalize the matrix, because not every matrix can be brought to a diagonal form, if we cannot do that, can we at least bring it to a simpler form, where we just see from the structure what this will be? And the answer is yes. So, first of all, why can we do this? Okay. Um, we can go into really long explanations about that and talk about vector spaces and, and transformations on spaces and that sort of stuff. But that's not interesting. And honestly, if you're learning about uh, row reduction, you're probably not at the point where it will even be any, of any use to you because it's a very abstract paradigm to get into. So what we learned in high school during algebra is that if we have a certain equation, let's say... Uh, y is uh, 2x, right? This is just, uh, I don't know, some some scalar equation. There's no vectors, there's no matrices. It's, it's just this. Then we know... Oh, my uh, audio source changed. My earbuds are... Uh, yeah, their battery's dead. So anyway... We know from, from algebra that we can multiply y by 2. And then on the right-hand side, we should do the same. So 4x. But if we plot this, we will get the exact same line. In other words, as long as we multiply the left-hand side and the right-hand side of linear equations by the same factor, the same scalar, um, the solutions will remain the same. And it's actually the same if we say y minus 5 equals 2x minus 5. Now we have added or subtracted some uh, constants from both sides of the equation. Actually, um, it's still the same line. The solution still hasn't changed. So you can do operations on linear equations um, and it it doesn't affect the solution. And that is one property that we would really like to abuse. Because what we saw in our linear system, 1, 1, 1, minus 1, x1, x2, 2, 3, equals, of course, we saw that we have some column here. And those will be the coefficients in the linear equation. We could make these variables a1 of 2, and we could call this beta 1. And what we would get is for the first equation, alpha 1 x1 plus alpha 2 x2 equals beta 2. Meaning that we can multiply the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the linear equation if we multiply this row and this row with the same number, and that will not change the solution. So that's called a row operation. We are just doing some operation on the row. We can do the same with uh, subtraction and addition, as we just saw with the example with the minus 5. So we can actually, and this is a little bit more elaborate to explain, so I'm not going to say it to you, but... If we have the matrix, um, there you go, yeah. If we have the system, we can actually subtract the um, first row from the second row or any row from any other row for that matter. We can subtract rows with respect to each other and they will not change the system. So we can say, uh, let's do R2 minus R1. R1 is R2 
new. I, yeah, my my handwriting is a little bit uh, messy today. So, for example, what would that give? Is the first row will remain the same? So x one two. But the second row will be 1 minus the first row, so 1. This becomes 0. And this term in the second row will become minus 1 minus the term from the first row, so minus 1. So minus 1 minus 1 is minus 2, of course. And this term doesn't change because we change the coefficients, not the variables. That's what we did in um, y is 2x, if we say y2 equals 4x, then we change the coefficients and not the variables. So x actually stays the same. But the other side of the equation, we need to also do the same operation. So 3 minus 2 becomes 1. Now, this is a little bit... Uh, cumbersome to write down, but you might have already seen that we actually simplified our matrix a little bit. We made a zero term here, and now if we write down the linear system equations, we have x1 plus x2 equals 2, and minus 2x2 equals 1. Now we can suddenly solve this system more quickly because if we now go back to the scalar method right we can immediately see that x2 equals minus 1 over 2 and if we solve the first equation when we substitute minus 1 over 2 for x2 we can see that um, when we do that substitution we get a x1 of 5 over 2 and we have found the same solution so was this row reduction? Um, yeah, actually, this was row reduction. But we didn't do full row reduction. Because can we go easier? Can we go further with the row reduction to simplify our system more? Yeah, yeah, we absolutely. We can also do R1 um, plus R2 over 2. Because we want to get this term to 0 now because we saw earlier that the diagonal form is the easiest form. But before we do that, we are going to take a step back. Because what we are doing now is correct, but it's more complicated than it needs to be. I wanted to show you first what row reduction is, but we can use easier notation. It's just a slight variation. So don't worry, um, it's, it's not much to, to learn. But in our linear system, uh, there you go, two, three. We established before that we need to do the same operation on the left side and the right side. And what we can do is we can do all the operations on the A matrix. remember what we did and we can do it on the b matrix afterwards um that's what we did now for the first step but i mean yeah that's just annoying especially if it gets really large and if you you can also do this with multiple steps for a like you completely diagonalize a first and then you do all the steps again on b you don't have to do it step by step left side right side you can do all the steps on the left side all the steps on the right side but actually um, it can be easier right because if we want to do the left and uh, if we want to do the same on the left side and the right side why don't we just turn them into one matrix and we just do the row operation on that whole matrix and then automatically we do it on the left and the right side at the same time so that is exactly what we are going to do we are going to augment the matrix as it's called. So you write that down as such. We augment 
A with B on the right side. That will be written as 1, 1, 1, minus 2 augmentation bar. This bar is just notation. It doesn't mean anything mathematically. It's just there for clarification that, okay, this originally is one matrix and this originally is another matrix or a vector. So two, three. But we can treat this as a two by three matrix now. And if we do row operations on this matrix, we immediately do it on A and B at the same time with the corresponding rows. So that's much easier. So let's take a look at how that works, okay? So we have this, two, three. It also becomes faster now to write down the system because I need, don't need to um, write the uh, X factor all the time. So we can do the same row reduction step we did before, same row operation. So we want to make this term zero, right? We want to diagonalize the A matrix because we have already seen that that is the easiest form to see the solution to the to the linear system. Um, this is the step we did before, and we're just going to do it again because we are still working with the same system. We just elaborated the notation a little bit. So that will give us 1, 1, 2, 0, minus 2, 1. Let's double check. Yeah, 3 minus 2 is indeed 1. Well done. <laughs> so can we diagonalize further? Yeah, sure. We can say the new first row will be row 1 minus row 2 over 2. And this will give us the matrix 0, minus 2, 1, 1. Now, 1. Actually, this needs to be a, a plus because there's already a negative sign here. So we can just add these numbers and they will cancel out. We don't have to subtract because positive and negative, right? So this term becomes 1 plus minus 2 over 2 is 0. And here we get 2 plus 1 half is 5 over 2. Now, what we did all the way at the beginning when I talked about row operations was that you can multiply the left side and the right side by the same scalar, by the same factor, and it doesn't change the solution to the system. So that's exactly what I'm going to do here, is I'm going to write R2 divided by minus 2. That will give us the augmented matrix 5 over 2 minus 1 over 2. Now remember that this part was A and this part was B. They're still the same. They're just the left hand side and the right hand side in terms of coefficients, not variables of the linear equations. So we can unpack this, undo the augmentation, and write it as a linear system again. That brings us to Hey, what's this? Well, writing out these um, linear equations of the system, we just get x1 is 5 over 2 and x2 is minus 1 over 2. Is that the solution we found before? Let's check. Mm -hmm. We, wrote, we uh, wrote down quite a lot. Yep. That is the solution that we found before. And so what we see is that it doesn't really matter if you do um, a scalar method to solve the linear system, or if you do row reduction, you will get the same result. But the scalar method easily becomes too much to handle for a little bit larger systems. Um, 
I would say do it for two by two. It doesn't matter. That's up up to preference for two by two. I would personally still do row reduction because if you get fast with row reduction, it's it's just super nice and it's a cleaner notation. It's very easy to structure it very well, so it's very readable. And I I kind of care about that. Um, but for a uh, three by uh, anything system or anything by three, anything larger than two by two, I would say go for a row reduction always. Now, this system has one solution, right? But can it happen that it's not possible to find any solution? And what does that look like? Or can it be that there are multiple solutions? Let's find out, right? Now, we have a very fast way of writing down systems. It will still mean the same, but we can write directly into augmented form. If this is new to you, maybe it's something to get used to a little bit, but you can pause the video and you could write it down as the full system if you want to. And um, maybe that way it works for you. It's a good exercise. So I'm just going to do it in augmented form. And if that is not immediately clear to you what that means, I recommend you write it down because apparently then you need that exercise. So I'm, I'm providing you with an opportunity there. Well, we had, we had this system. Now, um, let's write down this system. One, one, two, two. And what are we going to make here? Hmm. One, one. We can do row reduction on this, of course. And that will be row two minus two. Row one gives one, 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 zero, zero minus one. Now, think about this in terms of the, the linear equations of the system, right? Just by looking at this matrix, you're like, okay, it's just a matrix. What, do, what does it matter? Well, what does it matter? What does it mean? What it means is x1 plus x2 equals 1. Well, that's fine, but 0 times x1 plus 0 times x2 equals minus 1. Now think about that for a minute, hopefully less than a minute. It should be clear to you that this is impossible, right? 0 is minus 1. That's not true. It's just we cannot do that. So there are no solutions to the system. Oh, well, that is really nice about row reduction. And that is another reason why I think you should get accustomed to this and really learn to get an intuition for this is that from the structure of the A matrix, you can see if a system actually is um, solvable or not. If there is a zeros row in the A, but there is a non-zero in the B, then there cannot be a solution because you will always get to zero plus zero equals something non-zero. Now, of course, um, the other question is, but what if this is zero, does that mean that there is a solution? Well, yeah, sure, let's, let's write it down. So I'm not going to go directly into making this zero. I'm going to do one step in between, which is an even more simple system. So you should be happy that I'm doing this. Is I turned this into a zero. Now, if we write this down into the system equations, we get x1 equals 1 and zero equals zero. Now, this makes sense, right? 
But what can we say about X2? Because we need to say something about X2 to know if there can be solutions or how many there are. Well, we could just write this down as 0 times X1 plus 0 times X2 equals 0. Well, we know X1 is 1, so this is 0 times 1. But we don't care about that because it's a constant. So 0 times X2 equals 0. What are valid options for X2? Is 0 valid? Yeah. Is 1 valid? Yeah. Is 1.5 valid? Sure. Is minus 1 valid? Yeah. Actually, anything really is valid. Um, yeah, I, I mean, infinity is not a number, so you cannot put it there. Because if you put in infinity, then uh, you might get into some uh, problems. But infinity is not a number, so I'm just going to say anything is valid. Any number is valid. Um, complex numbers? Sure. Yeah. Complex numbers are totally fine. So what can we say about the solution of this? Well, we can say that x1 is 1, right? What can we say about x2? Um, not much. It can be anything. That's right. So the best thing that we can write down is that the solution exists as 1 and x2. x1 is 1, x2 is just x2, and it doesn't matter. This is called a free variable. You can do anything you want with it. In that sense, it's free. And it doesn't matter. There will always be a solution. So it's totally free for the solvability of this system. Um, another word is linear independence. X1 and X2 are linearly independent. So by changing X2, you don't change what X1 needs to be. So what, the, what does that mean? Linear dependence. Is that the same as being a free variable? Um, sort of. Not really. Not per se. But yeah, sort of. So let's go back to this system. Because I said I wanted to change this to a zero. But first I wanted to show you this system, right? So let's let's go back to this system. It's a variation of what we had before. This system had no solution. This system had infinite solutions. So take a guess. You don't have to tell me. Uh, you can comment if you want. I might reply, but um, what what is the solution to this? How many solutions does it have? Does it even have a solution? Well, let's find out. Just write down the, the um, system equations. So x1 plus x2 equals 1. And 0 times x2 equals 0. Even 0 times x1. So what can we say? Well, we know that in this equation, x1 and x2 can be anything, but they are defined together also in this equation. They are constrained, as you could maybe call it. So this equation, if you want an expression for x1, you could say x1 equals 1 minus x2. Right. So now we know that Regardless, if you want to express this as one of these two, the other one can be free. You can choose one to be free. You can say x1 can be anything, or x2 can be anything. But the other is 1 minus whatever you choose it to be. So we say, okay, let's make x2, let's make it free for choice, right? We can, in this expression, we can say x2 can be anything. But then we say, okay, but x1 is 1 minus x2. So if we say it can be anything, so x2 is 0, then x1 must be 0. Now, 
we can do the exact same thing with x1 as well. We can say, oh, oh, but uh, 0 times x1, apparently it doesn't really matter what it is. Well, no, but we have this expression here. So we know that whatever we choose x1 to be, x2 needs to be 1 minus x1. So if we choose it to be 2, then x2 will be minus 1. If we choose x1 to be 3, then x2 will be minus 2. Um, so there, there is one free variable, just as in here. There's one free variable, but they are not linearly independent. That is because you can choose one to be free, right? We can use this first expression, so we say x1 is 1 minus x2, and x2 is whatever we want it to be. But then x1 is defined in terms of x2. So they are linearly dependent. x1 depends on the value that we choose for x2. We can also use this expression instead of the top one, and then we would get x1 and 1 minus x1 and they are still linearly dependent but now x1 is the free variable we can we can choose whatever we want but they do depend on each other we can only choose one and the other one will be defined in terms of the other so this these two well these two vectors are identical in the context of our system Right, they are the same expression. If we choose um, some value for x2, we can choose a value for x1 that will be the same. Um, let's say we we choose x2 to be zero, and then x1 will be one minus zero, so we get one zero. Now, if we get if we take that one that we just got for x1, we say x1 is one, then one minus one is zero. So as long as we are a consequence, uh, what's the word? Um, as long as we are consistent with um, what we choose, then we can actually say these are the same. So free variables and linear independence are not exactly the same, but they are linked concepts. So we have found already two systems with an infinite amount of solutions, but some are completely linearly independent and others are uh, somewhat linearly dependent, right? If you have three variables then you might have one free variable and two linear dependent so there are degrees to this because you could you could have a three by three system meaning uh, you have three variables for x and uh, they could all be linearly independent so that means that for example you can write your a as a three by three identity then they are all linearly independent, but none of them are free. But you could write it, for example, as this. Then, um, then there is linear dependence, right? Because x2 and x3 will depend on each other because it's multiplied like this. equals some sum b it doesn't matter what it is now if this is a zero and the last number in b is also a zero then x3 becomes a free variable x3 and x2 are still linearly dependent because they or defined in terms of each other. But we can choose x3 to be whatever we want. And x2 will have to adjust to that. So x3 is free. 
but x2 and x3 are also linearly dependent. And then suppose this is a 1, then x1, just multiply this out, write down the equation, you get 1 times x1 equals 1. So x1 is not free, and it is linearly independent. That is what um, row reduction basically is. And that's how you can see from um, just the structure of the A and the B if systems are, um, if they have solutions, if they have one solution, maybe infinite solutions. It doesn't really happen that they have a finite number of solutions. That's not for linear systems, that's for nonlinear systems, but we have not covered that today. And we can even see if x and uh, x1, x2, maybe x3, depends on the size of your system, if the different x variables, if they are free to choose, if they are dependent of each other, linearly independent, or, um, or if they are both free, because that could happen as well. And of course, when they're both free, I didn't, I didn't show this, but if they're both free, you would get the most trivial system ever. I mean, they're, they're independent from each other. And they're both free because choosing one does not affect what the other should be so they're independent linearly independent and uh, they're both free because they're not constrained by something in the b they are whatever you want them to be so that is a lot it's a lot to learn and i really really went off track with how much i put in this video it's been uh, almost uh, three quarters of an hour, but uh, I don't know. I, to me, this is fun. I like explaining these sort of things. And um, yeah, just linear algebra is also just fun. Um, we, we did cover, like from A and B structures, what you can derive about the characteristics of the variables and their solutions. So... In that regard, we didn't waste time. This is even better of a lesson. And I really recommend you to play around with this for a little bit. For You could also use the, the scalar method of solving this for a 3x3. Three three. And you will see that it, I mean, it's still doable, right? I've, I've done it before also, before I learned linear algebra. And um, it's, it's absolutely doable, but it's just a lot of work. And you could try to do the same system with uh, row reduction, and you will see that... It's just, it's faster at that point. For, for a 3x3, three three for sure, it's it's much faster. And especially if you get good at it, then also you can really quickly see if there will even be solutions. And if there will not be solutions, you can just say, oh, I know there will be no solutions. And um, maybe you could write it in terms of uh, the linear dependent uh, states or x variables. I, I call x variable state sometimes. So let me know what you thought of this video. Uh, I hope you liked it. And if you didn't like it, I hope it was still useful to you. Um, feel free to write any comments. I will probably reply because I spend a lot of time on YouTube. But um, I, I mean, uh, I'm not uh, considering uh, building some YouTube empire or whatever. So um, I, I won't be very... Uh, I won't be uploading a lot of videos, but if you have specific questions, I i am very much interested in making a video about that. So uh, yeah, let me know. I hope you had a great time. Bye-bye.